Lindsay's books were big. Hal Lindsay predicted that Jesus would return by 1989 and then that the rapture would take place in 1983 or two. And obviously that didn't happen. And so, you know, I have shied away, I guess, from end times dramatic sermons. But as I'm preaching through 2 Thessalonians, this is the topic Paul picks up on. The 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the main topic here is the Antichrist, the beast, the, the abomination of desolation. He has a lot of names in scripture. Paul calls him here in this text, the man of lawlessness. All right, so we're going to look at what this text says. I got a few cross references, and I got to tell you, I could have had a whole bunch more cross references. We could go into the 666 and the mark of the beast and all that. I've restrained myself uh, on going into all of that. But first, Pastor Herrick's got his joke of the day. I have set up here names in this joke are totally fictitious, and there's no relationship to reality. Pastor Herrick answers the phone. Hello, is this Pastor Herrick? It is. This is Dan at the IRS. Can you help us? Remember, names are totally fictitious in this. Can you help us? I can. Do you know an Alan Smith? Yeah, you thought it was going to be Alan something else in there, but I changed it. I do. Is he a member of your congregation? He is. Did he donate $100,000 to the church? He will. <laughs> now that I got him under my thumb and know the IRS. Is <laughs> All right, so let's jump into this. Here's our text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You remember the problem in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 was that the persecution was... was more severe than it had been, and Paul encourages them to stand fast. Now he starts Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and he picks up on another topic. We'll get into that. Let's, let's read this text. Verses 1 through 12, so a rather lengthy text. Now concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and, the, and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 
There's our text for today, verses 1 through 12 of chapter 2. Here's my outline. I hope you picked up, and no, it's not a nice solid cardboard, so you may have had to use Dan's uh, clipboards out there. He provides those because some weeks I have the cardboard and some weeks I just have flimsy paper here. But here's my outline. You can fill in the blanks. First of all, the problems of the Thessalonians, verses 1 and 2, they had a problem. And Paul is trying to straighten that problem out here. Number two, the coming of the man of lawlessness in verses 3 and 4. The restrainer of the man of lawlessness in verses 5, 6, and 7. Point four, the power of the man of lawlessness in verses 8 and 9. And then the followers of the man of lawlessness in verses 10 through 12. The followers of the man of lawlessness. Okay, so I've tried to outline it, go right through the text. Let's uh, jump into this. Point number one, the problem of the Thessalonians. All right, before I read this again, here's the picture. Paul came to Thessalonica, preached the gospel, Many got saved, and right away there was persecution. Well, Paul is left because of the persecution. They, Paul, you better get out of here. And the persecution continued. And in fact, between 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, the problem got worse. The persecution seems to have gotten worse. Paul dealt with that in chapter 1. But in the middle of one of their services, one of the Christian services, Somebody stands up and says, People, the Spirit has spoken to me that we are in the middle of the day of the Lord. You miss the rapture and the day of the Lord. Look at the persecution around us. The Spirit has told me to tell you that we're in the middle of the day of the Lord. And they go, What? No, that's not right. And then he says, I even have a letter from the Apostle Paul himself that says we are in the middle of the day of the Lord. And some of the Thessalonians began to believe this person, whoever it was. So Paul writes here to try to straighten them out and tell them, no, I didn't send no letter. Look what he says here. He says, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. You remember in 1 Thessalonians, that passage where we are raptured up into heaven. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word. So somebody said that the spirit had told them that we're in the day of the Lord. And then he says, or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Somebody, whether a false teacher, uh, seems to have come from their midst, but somebody was trying to tell them and even, even say that he had a letter from the Apostle Paul that, that the day of the Lord had come. So Paul is straightening them out. No, the day of the Lord has not come. I know you're under persecution. It seems like this could be the day of the Lord because you're under persecution. But let me tell you what's got to come first. And then so he goes into this passage, okay? So isn't that interesting? Somebody actually produced a letter. So when he was at home, he says, I know what I'll do. I'll write a letter as if it was from Paul, and I'll show that to the Thessalonians so that they think that it is, a, you know, how could, how could somebody do that? Well, Paul is trying to straighten them out here. Don't be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed that this person is trying to deceive you. Uh, here's a cross-reference. At the end of this letter, Paul says, okay, Thessalonians, to help you know letters that are truly from me or not, here's how we'll do it. He says this, the very second to the last, he, he closes with the verse 18, you know, the grace of the Lord Jesus be Christ be with you. But he says here, second to the last verse of the, of the epistle, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. So here's my handwriting. 
We use signatures today. I know that that gets really difficult in this electronic age. I like it when you got it in the store, you got to take that little electronic attached pen and you got to sign your name. I usually just go, you know, and, and it doesn't look anything like my signature. But Paul's handwriting would show them that it was truly from him. And he says, this is a sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I... I write. So he's telling them, if it doesn't have my signature on the end in my handwriting, don't believe it because I do this with all of the genuine letters that I write. So he's trying to, trying to straighten the Thessalonians out from somebody who was deliberately trying to deceive them about the day of the Lord. Okay, point number two the coming of the man of lawlessness. Now, I got to tell you this. Uh, again, whether does this passage clearly teach pre-tribulational rapture or post-tribulational rapture? No, it doesn't clearly teach either one. And, and uh, all the articles and things I was reading about this, those who were pre-trib, they clearly saw pre-trib in this passage, you know, and those who didn't, they didn't see no pre-tribulation rapture in this passage. So, so, you know, I have to say that as we jump into it. But the coming of the man of lawlessness. Now, despite, here, here's, here's an attitude that I have seen many times there are believers, because there is division among our interpretation about eschatology. Eschatology is the, the big fancy name for end times, what's going to happen in the end time. Because there is differences of opinion on the order of events, Christians seem to back away from it and say, you know, well, I, I, the experts can't, don't know how it's all going to turn out. I'm not going to get into that. And they stay away from these things. But here's a whole chapter. And, and they, they say, well, I read the book of Revelation. And it's all full of figurative stuff and I can't understand it. So I'm not just going to, I'm not going to worry about end times things. But here is an epistle 2 Thessalonians, an entire chapter taken up by the topic of these end time events. It is important for us to care about because God has given to us many, many passages in Scripture dealing with the end times. Whether we can fully sort them out, you need to study God's Word and come to a conclusion yourself. This guy is going to be real. Okay, clearly says it here. Let's look at these verses, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the rebellion comes first. There's going to be kind of a, an event in the church called the rebellion, a falling away. We're going to look at a verse dealing with that. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Next verse who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, it's very clear in Scripture that in the end times, in the day of the Lord, you go to the book of Daniel. Daniel says this guy is going to confirm a covenant with Israel for a period of seven years. Taught in the book of Daniel. In the middle of the seven years, he's going to stop them from doing their sacrifices in the temple. And he's going to go into the temple and he's going to take his seat and say, no more worshiping that Jesus fella, no more worshiping that Jehovah fella, I'm God. And if you're going to do any sacrificing, you're going to do it to me. I am the God. Paul says it here in 2 Thessalonians that he's going to take himself, uh, he says, take his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, that means something has got to happen. Well, first of all, we would say that would have meant that Israel that was scattered for two millennia since Titus, the Roman general, 
came down and wiped out Jerusalem and Israel, and they were scattered throughout the world, that meant that Israel would have to become a nation again which miraculously, some years back now, um, took place. And Israel is a thriving, growing nation right in the midst of a bunch of uh, Arab and Muslim countries who are always firing missiles at them. And you heard Netanyahu had to cut his, short, his, his visit to the United States short because Syria was, was sending missiles and he went back home early. That's always happened. So Israel needs to be brought back as a nation, which God did. But the next thing that needs to happen in the day of the Lord is that the temple, the sacrificing needs to be going on and the temple's got to be there. Now, here's what happened. I don't want to go into all, you know, I could, I could just talk on prophecy here for a whole bunch of, but the Muslims, and I think directed by Satan, because he's behind the unbelievers, they built a Muslim shrine on the old Temple Mount. The temple was destroyed, and the Dome of the Rock is a, it is the second most important Muslim shrine. Mecca is the first, and the Dome of the Rock is the second most important shrine of the Muslims. So if Israel was to say, all right, let's tear that thing down and rebuild our temple, whoa! You know, I think Satan got that thing built there on purpose. Somewhere in here, I, we don't know how it's going to happen, but the temple's going to be rebuilt. Maybe one of those Syrian missiles will, will accidentally hit on the Dome of the Rock. We don't know what's going to happen, you know. But uh, the temple is going to be rebuilt, and there's all kinds of talk of that in Israel today. But in the, let me get back to the text now. In the, in the day of the Lord, in the end times, I believe the rapture has taken place. We're in the middle of the day of the Lord. This man of lawlessness is going to be kind of a world ruler, and he's going to set himself up as God in the temple in Jerusalem and say, no more sacrificing, I'm the true God. Of course, he is a messenger from Satan. Let me give you some cross-references here again, and I could go hog wild with these cross-references about the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, the beast of Revelation, you know. But here, let's look at the, well, first of all, the rebellion. Paul says, 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says this. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, the day of the Lord, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Notice that first verse. The Spirit has shown Paul that there's going to be a great falling away from the faith in the end times. The rebellion. And then the man of lawlessness is going to be revealed. Okay? Here we have, I know it's one of those passages in Revelation that's filled with pictures and symbolism, and it's hard to understand. But if you relate it to the man of lawlessness, this is what it says, Revelation chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems on the horns and blasphemous names on his heads. What does that symbolism all mean about the ten horns and the seven heads and all of that? I don't know. Everyone has to say, and they all got their speculation. It's going to be a council of ten countries with seven men on it. And, you know, we don't know, you know. But this is talking about a particular person. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon. Now, we know the dragon earlier in Revelation. He is Satan. And the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Satan gets this beast, as he's called here, to have great authority and great power. Let's go on. One of his heads seems to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. Again, one of those, one of those 
false miraculous powers that Satan gives to him. He Maybe it's an attempted assassination and he comes through it. We don't know what this exactly will be. Um, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon. They're going to worship Satan through the beast. For he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? So the world is going to follow this man of lawlessness. He will be a world ruler. He will have false powers from Satan. Now, by false, I don't mean that they really aren't miraculous powers. Satan seems to be able to do miraculous powers, miraculous healings, miraculous signs, just as God had done. Um, and he will give that power to this uh, man of lawlessness. So here's an interesting cross-reference. This beast is seen now from chapter 13 throughout the book of Revelation. Okay? All right. The man of lawlessness. There are many other passages, and I could have gone for hours on these passages, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, about this person. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, and Daniel chapter 13 all speak about him. Jesus, in Matthew 24, refers back to Daniel and talks about the abomination of desolation is going to come. Paul's reference here that he's going to set himself up in the temple as God. Uh, and large portions of the book of Revelation tell us about him. So this man in the end times is going to be real. He's going to be Satan's puppet. He's going to be a world ruler. Many people are going to follow him. And I don't even want to get started in the mark of the beast and the 666 and all of that. But the world is going to follow him. Okay. So whether you believe in a pre-tribulation or rapture or not, this person is clearly spoken of in Scripture as coming in the last days. Okay? You can't deny that he will be coming wherever the rapture is placed in there. Okay, the restrainer of the man of lawlessness. Paul goes into something very interesting here in verses 5, 6, and 7. He says this, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So Paul has taught him all of these things. So the, the, the thing is, this passage is a little bit mysterious because Paul has already taught him about it in person. And he says, well, you remember when I was with you and I told you all about that. You know, so we don't get it here in the book of 2 Thessalonians because Paul told him face to face. He says, you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things. He says, and you know... What is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time? There's going to be a certain time in history where he will be allowed to come, but not yet. Um, he is being restrained by, Paul never says it here, he says, you Thessalonians know what is restraining him. <laughs> so he never, he never says it here, but something is restraining him from coming during our church age here. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. There's this power that is working in our society. There is lawlessness, there is rebellion, there are unsaved, rebellious people. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Okay, so at a certain point, this restrainer is going to be taken out of the way, and then the man of lawlessness will be able to, to come. Sounds really strange, doesn't it? I mean, we, we, we aren't told who he is. Okay, I, I got this from a, a, a good, reputable site, uh, and that was, it was, he kind of covered it pretty good, so I, I just quoted him. Paul does not specifically identify what or who the restraining force is, since the Thessalonians already knew, okay? This is quoting directly from this site. 
Many scholars have speculated as to the identity of the restrainer, naming the restraining force as uh, the Roman government, maybe, the gospel preaching, the binding of Satan, the providence of God, the Jewish state, the church, the Holy Spirit, or Michael, even Michael the archangel. We, you know, those have all been suggested as the strainer by, uh, by Bible scholars. Yeah, okay? Now, we believe, and I hold the same thing that they do, that we believe that the strainer is none other than the Holy Spirit. I believe it's the Holy Spirit holding back the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, from coming. He says, or we should say, the Holy Spirit working through the New Testament church. Jesus has called us the salt of the earth, the light of the world and the salt of the earth, right? What does salt do? Well, salt adds flavor, but in biblical times, the most important thing about salt is that it preserves meat from getting rotten and putrid. Jesus says we are the salt of the earth. We are restraining evil wickedness from becoming as bad as it can be. And Paul says that that restraining power is going to be taken out of the way at a certain point and the man of lawlessness will be revealed. I myself believe that that will be the rapture of the church taken out of the world and the restraining force of the Holy Spirit and then the man of lawlessness will come. Uh, those who hold to the pre-tribulation or after see the church being taken out of the world seeing the end of the restraint of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay, so that's quoted from that site, and I, I, I believe that that's what it is. Again, Paul does not tell us who this restrainer is. I think it's probably biblically strong to say it's the Holy Spirit restraining him. Okay, the power of the man of lawlessness. Now, Paul goes into a few verses here talking about, well, how powerful is this guy? Well, he says here, and then the lawless one will be revealed... The restrainer is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Well, what is his power compared to Jesus? Well, <laughs> yeah, you can see that here, nothing. But, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Okay, so I, that was a quote of a passage we already looked at here. Um, or here's, here's the quote of it. We looked at this earlier, Revelation 13. And to it, the dragon, Satan, gave his power and his throne and his great authority. He has the power of Satan behind him. He is, uh, you might almost say, Satan incarnate. It's interesting in Scripture how Satan often copies uh, the practices of God. We read how this beast was mortally wounded and was healed again. Well, we have Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying and three days later was resurrected again. Satan, through the Antichrist, is trying to mimic God again. Satan gives him his power. He's going to have, our verse back here, he's going to have false signs and wonders. And you can see how the whole world will say, oh, wow, let's follow him. Okay? All right, here's another. Now, so he's going to be powerful, but if you compare him to Jesus, this is at the end. Uh, his power is nothing compared to Jesus. This is at the end of the book of Revelation. The beast, and another person in there, the false prophet. And uh, it's interesting, coming, studying Daniel and studying Revelation, uh, in the end times Israel is gathered together as a nation, but the whole world hates them, and the king from the south, and the king from the north, and the king from the east, book of Daniel has all three of those, come against him. In other words, you might say, the whole world converges on a valley in Israel called Hermageddon, we get our word Armageddon from that. And there they are, all of the forces of the world trying to beat up on little Israel. And this is what happens. Okay? Verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on a horse and against his army. Jesus is coming back earlier than this. It talked about the white horse whose names were true obviously Jesus there, okay, and the beast was captured, okay, 
If this was a movie, okay, the whole world is coming against Israel, Jesus comes back in, in, the, in the clouds. If this was a Hollywood movie, there would be a long, drawn-out battle scene, and it would look like, it would look like Jesus is going to lose, and then something's going to change, and then Jesus will, will come through in the end. John wasn't that dynamic of a writer. <laughs> All of the world gathers together. They're coming to get Jesus and... Verse 20, and the beast was captured and the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs and by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped the image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Kind of anti-dramatic because Jesus is so powerful. Jesus snaps his fingers and boom, the battle's over, you know. <laughs> Jesus wins, that's it. Uh, the, the man of lawlessness uh, is thrown into the lake of fire. We talked about that last week. Okay, the followers of the man of lawlessness, and I'm just about done here. Verses 10, 11, and 12. Of which all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Many, many, many in the world will be following him. Therefore, look at verse 11, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. They have made their choice. They chose to reject Jesus Christ and to follow the Antichrist. And so God sends them delusions that they will not understand, will not see the truth. They are going to follow the man of lawlessness. In order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now let me tell you this. This is what I believe this is teaching here. A person in the church age who hears the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for them and all they need to do is receive the gift of eternal life and God will begin to work in their life and change them. The gospel message, if they have heard the gospel message and rejected it, and then the rapture takes place and they are left behind, you would think people would say, oh, I guess that Bible stuff was true. I better receive Jesus now. This seems to indicate that if they have heard the gospel and rejected it, they will not be able to. To believe and come to Jesus Christ. They will become followers of the man of lawlessness. They will be sent strong delusions so they will not understand the gospel message. That's quite a severe warning. People who have rejected the gospel here in this age, yeah, the rapture takes place, the man of lawlessness comes, they've already made their decision to reject the gospel, they're going to follow him. And they as well will eventually be cast into the lake, the eternal lake uh, that burns with sulfur, however that was described. We call it the lake of fire and brimstone. Uh, the new, uh, the uh, ESV has burns with sulfur. So that's quite a sharp, scary warning to those who have rejected the gospel. Okay, cross-reference, Second, yeah, Second Corinthians here. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. My point in this passage is in the church age, Satan may blind their eyes to the truth so that they won't believe the gospel. And then they reject the gospel. And when the man of lawlessness comes, they will follow him. Okay, conclusion. We are not in the day of the Lord. <laughs> that has not come yet. The rapture will take... My, I hold to a pre-tribulational rapture. The rapture will take place and then the, coming, then the coming of the man of lawlessness. He will set himself up as God in the temple of God. Then Jesus will return and cast him into the lake of fire. Those who reject the gospel of this age will not believe during the tribulation period. 
I hope that each one here has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this passage. Though, Lord, we look at it and there are many questions and sometimes difficult to understand, you have laid it here for us to study and to learn. I pray that we might be faithful to you to share the gospel with others and that they might believe. Father, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In